Chapter 17 The hunters who found Alan belonged to a tribe of 31 women, 10 men, and 7 children. Only two of the children were boys. At first, Alan thought that he had fallen in with a tribe of Eskimos who had been converted to Christianity. Although their religion was rather primitive and often mixed up with pagan beliefs and customs, they did believe in Jesus Christ and they used the cross as a symbol to ward off evil spirits and to bring them good luck on a hunt. While serving on the Ann Forbes, Alan had heard that Danish missionaries were in Greenland hoping to convert the Eskimos. But when Alan tried to find out if it was the Danish missionaries who brought Christianity to the tribe, he ran into some puzzling facts. The tribe members, especially Harard, who knew the tribal history back for a very long time, said that the tribe had been Christian for many years, for hundreds of years. Harard knew of no missionaries. No Europeans had ever paid them a visit. As best he could, Alan questioned them about the whalers. Yes, they had seen the great ships on the seas, but they had never gone on board any of the huge vessels, nor had they ever talked to any of the sailors. They were afraid to. They had heard from another tribe of Eskimos that the whale ships captured Eskimos and brought them to their own countries to serve as slaves. Most of this information came in bits and pieces and Alan was never sure if he fully understood what Harard or Intuk or Uta was telling him. Because he did not understand their language, he had to rely on signs and pictures drawn on the sand of the beach and imitations with his body to get his thoughts across. It was all very difficult and some things he was sure he had gotten wrong. For example, he thought that Harar told him that none of the members of the tribe were Eskimos, but it all come to the land where Eskimos lived from a country that was very far to the east, many days sail across the sea. In fact, Alan began to suspect that Harar meant that the tribe originally came from Europe. The members of the tribe even seemed to recognize the name Norway. But that was impossible. Harard and the others were obviously Eskimo. In order to clear up these mysteries, Alan decided to learn the tribe's language as soon as possible. The tribe made its home in caves beneath an overhanging cliff. There was a large cave with many small rooms leading off it. Because the ground at the back of the cliff was permanently frozen, the hunters used small rooms in this part of the cave for storing food. Such rooms were natural refrigerators. The larger areas at the front of the cave were closed in with walls of caribou skin erected over frames of driftwood and whale bone. In winter the tribe took down the skin tents and made igloos. And just like an igloo, the main entrance to the cave had a long snow tunnel that could be entered only on hands and knees. On very cold nights in winter, the dogs crept into the snow tunnel for warmth. Nancy soon became a favorite with the tribe, and the children loved to take her fishing. They thought it was great fun to see her slide into the water, come back up with a fish in her mouth, and lay it on the ground in front of them. Needless to say, she did not give up all her fish, but kept one for herself every once in a while. But Nancy had trouble with the dogs, who were often used to hunt polar bears, and therefore saw Nancy as an enemy. Because of the dogs, who slept outside the cave or at the tunnel entrance, Nancy stayed with Alan in one of the rooms inside the cave. Alan soon trained Nancy to pay no attention to the dogs and to avoid them as much as possible. As time passed, the dogs learned to leave Nancy alone. For one thing, she could easily kill one of them with a swipe of her paw. As long as Nancy stayed with the tribe, she and the dogs never became friendly. Strangely enough, the several puppies at, at the camp had no fear of Nancy, and she often played with them. The puppies would growl and tug at her fur, and Nancy would tumble them upside down and roll them over on the ground with her paw, yet she never hurt any of them. As soon as Alan learned a few words of the tribe's language, he began to urge 
in took to make a trip to the Ann Forbes. But Alan soon realized that the tribe had more than one master. While Harard was a sort of priest and wise man, when it came to hunting or making any trips away from camp, it was Intuk who led the party. However, Uta seemed to be the most popular man in camp. Whenever any disputes came up, Uta was called in to solve them. In Usklik, one of the older women was the tribe's doctor. She knew what medicines to make for infections, what prayers to say for each sickness. Alan soon became special friends with one of the young hunters, Eric by name. Eric was about the same age as Alan, which made it easier to become friends with him. Alan soon discovered that the men were afraid to make a trip to the Ann Forbes. Perhaps they thought that all of Alan's friends were still on the ship and might seize them or do them harm. Perhaps they found it hard to believe that one of the, those huge ships could simply be abandoned to the ice. As the days and then weeks passed, Alan learned more and more of the new language. The more he learned, the harder he worked to get Intuk to search for the Ann Forbes. Alan appealed to the women. The canvas of Alan's knapsack and the cloth of his clothing astonished the women, and they found it hard to believe that such materials were made from fibers and did not come from the backs of animals. The women made all the clothing for the tribe and were extremely skilled at the job. They could make sealskin boots that were so tightly sewn as to be absolutely waterproof. They could make jackets and trousers that were cold proof as well as waterproof. But all the materials they used in their clothing came from the skins of animals and birds. Alan let it be known that there was much cloth and canvas on the Ann Forbes, and this particularly interested the women. It took a long time to make an animal skin into clothing. Every tiny piece of fat had to be carefully scraped off the hide, and then the skin itself had to be chewed and chewed again so that it would be soft enough to bend easily when it was dry. For this reason, a supply of canvas or cloth seemed very desirable to the women. Then Alan turned to the men. The hunters very much admired Alan's carving knife since they had no metal tools or weapons of any kind. Old Harar did remember his father talking about a wonderful material, iron, that could be used in knives and harpoon and spear points, a material that never wore out. The tribe had no iron of any kind and made all their weapons and tools from whale and walrus and caribou bone. They even made fishing hooks and sewing needles out of bone. So Alan told them there was plenty of iron on the Ann Forbes, enough iron to last the tribe for many, many years. But they had to go soon. If they waited much longer, the sea ice would break up and the Ann Forbes sink or drift many miles out of their way. Finally one day, a month after Alan's arrival, it was decided that Intuk and five other men would take all the healthy dogs and half a dozen sleds and look for the Ann Forbes. It took Alan and the men six days to find the ship, but the trip was well worthwhile. They loaded everything they could onto the sleds, boxes of tobacco and the box of clay pipes, all sorts of weapons like hatchets, lances, javelins, blubber knives, and the long flensing knives used for cutting up the whales, boat hooks, the carpenter's box of tools, which were badly rusted but still usable, the captain's silverware, baskets and buckets and kegs of nails. They took half a dozen pieces of pig iron, part of a supply that had been used for ballast on the ship. They took barrels of meat and what was left of the barrel of rum. Everything was loaded on the sleds, sail canvas from the raft, clothing, carpeting from the cabin, oil lamps, rope, and coal. They loaded one sled with nothing but whale blubber, so that they could make a fast run home and not have to stop and hunt seal for themselves and the dogs. At last all the sleds were loaded and everyone ready for the trip back. Alan turned around for a last look at the ship. For a moment he actually felt homesick for his cabin. The Ann Forbes had kept him alive for almost two years and he knew that he would never see the old wreck again. Say goodbye to our old home, Nancy he ordered his pet.
With a shout, Intook called to his dogs, and the animals fanned out, leaning into their seal skin traces. Soon half a dozen sleds and several dozen dogs were scattered over the ice. Alan and Nancy had to hurry to keep up. In three days the men were back at their home camp, and everyone was very happy and excited by all the new material the tribe had acquired. They all learned to smoke and went at it with such enthusiasm that in less than a week all the tobacco was gone. However, some of the men learned to smoke dried moss and claimed it was even better than tobacco. The women were delighted by the fine slender needles of Alan's housewife kit. Their own needles were made from caribou bone, which steadily wore away and often broke. The hunters, especially Krikvik, who made the best harpoons, learned to tip all their weapons, their lances and harpoons and caribou blade knives, with iron points that were well sharpened on a piece of whetstone salvaged from the Ann Forbes. One day Alan took his fowling piece and, with the whole tribe watching, shot a snow ptarmigan, a bird frequently found in the Arctic. The men were more impressed with the noise than anything else. Some thought Alan managed the trick through a sort of magic. Intook was actually disappointed when he found out that Alan's gun could not shoot something on the other side of a tall ice ridge. Because of all the new and marvelous objects the tribe now had, Alan became something of a hero to everyone, and was considered a very important member of the family. And because he was young and strong and the tribe was short of young men, he became one of their leaders. After all, he had helped to bring them much good fortune. And yet, not everyone was happy with Alan. Some of the hunters, especially Intook, did not think too highly of him. Oh, it was true that Alan had helped to find many wonderful new things for the tribe, and his magic was very strong, or he, or he would not have been able to tame a polar bear. Those things were true, Intook admitted to the others. But it was also true that any ten-year-old could read tracks that were a mystery to Alan, could smell walrus long before Alan could, could see much further, and even hear better than Alan. As far as Intook was concerned, Alan was just another mouth to feed, and a mouth that would eat far more than it could find for the tribe. Still, Alan was happy enough with his life, except for one thing. No one had any idea where the whaling ships could be found. In fact, no member of the tribe had ever been on board a whaling vessel, and no member of the tribe seemed to want to visit one. Every time Alan brought up the subject of whaling ships, People acted afraid, and someone soon began to talk of other things. And yet Alan was confident that one day someone would bring word that a whaling ship was upon the sea.